Roger. Hello, hello, hello. I also remember you telling me about some band you were into, and you said you were out on the piss with the fella, the singer, all day. And at the venue or summit, somebody was up on stage singing because he hadn't turned up. And he just wandered up to the stage, punched the fella, grabbed the mic and did the gig. No, no, that, <laughs> what, no, that was a um, slightly different story. It oh, was, right. um, It was a chap who was a singer in a blues band called Mickey Wheeler. Right. And I think, I think this is the story. He, was, he, he actually got up with his band singing. And we had been drinking all day. But someone threw a pint pot at him while he was singing. Right. I think he was, he was. I don't know what he was singing. He was singing, you know, some old blues number. The pipe pot was empty. It glanced off his cheek and went behind. He came out of the audience, twatted this bloke, and got back for the next verse. That was it. I remember you Fantastic. telling me it because I was singing in bands starting off, like because I was seventeen, eighteen, or whatever. I should probably explain. You were my tutor at college when uh, we were doing the. Uh, was it visual communications combined A level? It was called. Mm. And you, I remember you saying, "Oh no, no, no! This is what you do if you're a singer." <laughs> <laughs> and told me the tale about him. Yeah, he's a great man, Mickey Wheeler. Great man. He's still going then. Still going. Fantastic. Um, he's the sort of bloke who, he'd invite you out for a pint, and he'd end up drinking all evening, but he'd forget to bring his money. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like me. So it, some of it did stick in, <laughs> but um. No, they were good days they were on that course. I mean, I know that I never did fucking anything. I mean, I wanted to, you know, mm. but I just mm. didn't... Uh, mm. I lacked the uh, the application. Mm. Well, I, I was talking to somebody um, on Sunday, actually, who was also a lecturer in FE College at about the same time, and we both agreed that the nature of further education has changed so much... Massive. ...that we'd both probably last about three days and then get sacked. Yeah, yeah. Well, I've moved into that I've done teaching in that regard now mm. and I can't imagine the shit that we used to get up to no, no. going to the pub at dinner time mm. and stuff mm. like that you know there was um, oh god there was a, a, a trip I, I uh, did with two of the lecturers and we took a group of I think they were second year BTEC students or something like that so they're, all, they're only about 17, 18, 19 and we took them to a Marxism Today conference in London didn't book any accommodation, and everyone slept on the floor of the Communist Party headquarters. Okay, now. No, you won't get away with that now. I remember our trip to Affleck's Palace. Do you remember that? Mm -hmm. When um, it was the corner house, we were having an exhibition right. on Central Station and right. Brody and yeah. Savile and yeah. all that all stuff. All Hacienda stuff. Yeah, yeah. great, great, great mm -hmm. exhibition. Like. Mm -hmm. And um, and one of our party nicked some of out of Affleck's. Do you remember that? I think I vaguely do. He was, um, Run Corn at one time used to breed, well, on that course anyway, we used to get sort of lads who were obsessed. I mean, really, uh, what do you call that? Cineophiles. Yeah, cine yeah, cine yeah, yeah, yeah. But they knew everything, didn't they? Yeah, yeah. You yeah. know. Knew much more than we did. Oh, totally. And yeah. they, they were quite intimidating because they just seemed to be mm. like, you know, that was their entire focus. Whereas I think the rest of us on this course, were sort of more of a, a broader spectrum of mm. into this and into that, but mm. they were just movies, movies, movies. And what always impressed me, and it sort of influenced me a little bit, was that they'd if they did you a film on video, they'd always put the director's name in brackets after the name oh, of the yeah. film. You know, oh, and yeah. you never did. Yeah, yeah. I remember, was it Terry? Terry. One of the lads called Terry. There was a lad called Terry, Tez. yes. Tez. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And he yeah. did me Salem's Lot and in brackets Tob Hooper. And I was like, <laughs> what the fuck is this? Like, you know, so anyway. So anyway, so one of these cinephiles nicked a clockwork orange from the basement of Affleck's. And you probably... It's an appropriate thing to nick, really. Well, it was. Yeah. If you remember, yeah. it was banned at the yeah. time, yeah. so you yeah. couldn't get it, yeah. but you could get it there. And so he nicked that, and Jesus Christ, there was no ringing the cops with those fellas, no, if you no. remember. No. It was like, no. you're going fucking mm. nowhere mm. until we get our mm. take back. Mm. I, I know that you and Dave smoothed the waters, mm. <laughs> and the tape was returned. But do you, do you know, the thing about those courses was that um, we had an unusual way of recruiting to them, because there was me and a, a couple of the blokes, we'd, we'd walk up the main street of Witness and just look for interesting people, interesting looking <laughs> people, and ask them, did they want to come on a course? Wow. So most of the people who were on those courses probably really shouldn't have been on the courses. I certainly shouldn't. Um, but it kind of gave them an opportunity, and we had quite unusual teaching methods, so um, it appealed to people who hadn't fitted in at school. Mm. Yeah. Um, and, you know, and 
There was a lot of. There was, in fact, there was. Uh, do you remember Mark Whitby? Yeah. I you know, know, Mark Whitby went on to become a lecturer himself, yeah, yeah, and yeah. you know, and Dandelion I, Radio was exactly well, he does yeah. now, Mark. And yeah. I think he was probably someone who didn't fit in at school. Probably not. Um, I only remember Mark as he was older than me. I think he mm. might have been lecturing by the time I got there. You know, mm. but he was certainly. Mm. He, he was a good lad, but there's lots of good people on them courses. I mean, the, the two the two standout people for me who actually were they on our courses or were they on the graphics course? Was uh, Carl and Gary? Yeah, you know, absolutely. And I, that that was it when I when I first started uh, teaching, I used to teach art and design, and what in those days was called our oh, social and life skills, right? For young people who were unemployed, and they were called YOP courses, Youth yeah. Opportunities Program. And Carl and Gary, who were twins, uh, were en were enrolled on these courses, but you never knew which one it was that had turned up. And right. like one had stay in bed, and the other one had pitch in, pretending he was right. And I just loved those lads, absolutely. And and they were they, academically, you know, they weren't top of the tree, but the passion about what they did and yeah. the the thirst for knowledge. Intellectually, they were absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah they were definitely there. Yeah, I yeah. mean. There was a whole bloody... They managed to turn <clears throat> quite shoddy material into something quite interesting in terms of the background. If you think of the, the way they romanticised West Bank, you know, I'm not saying West Bank's shoddy, but I think that they turned their background into very interesting stuff like the brown cows of elocution and, mm. and things mm. like that. Mm. And I think that the film that you made on mm. them was mm. an interesting piece as well. That, I remember seeing it very that, well. That little community... Um, and for people who don't know West Bank, um, it's underneath the bridge virtually, yeah. and it's and it's literally an island of a community because you've got the river, yeah. you've got the bridge, you've got that huge kind of multi highway that goes over, and then there's like a little industrial estate. Mm. So it is literally one road in, one road out. Yeah, and I remember realizing how um, apart from the rest of the world it seemed to me yeah. when I, sat, I was sat doing some research and I was sat in a pub. And there was a Domino's match going on. And I said to this bloke, you know, are you from round here? And he said, oh, no, I'm not from round here, mate. And he said where he was from. It was about 100 yards away. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And then I, I remember going to um, to a, a fish and chip shop and there were people going in with plates. Yeah. And the fish and chips were straight onto the plate and home. Yeah. I loved that place. Yeah, yeah, I yeah. Loved it. Absolutely loved it. And there was a real genuine community feel about the place. And... Everything that Carl and Gary did, the band they were in, Zen Baseball Bat, the photographs they took, the paintings they did, everything was an attempt to interpret that community. Yeah. So the great thing about doing a film about them was you did a film about them, and de facto it was about the community as well. Yeah. Which, you know, worked really well. Yeah. And, you know, West Bank is a is the sort of place that doesn't make it onto TV. No. But it did that day, yeah. you know. It's so I was, I was quite proud of that film. To be it honest, it is. It's well worth that being was, proud of. And that was that was the very first for television film I did. Yeah, that was the first one. That was about nineteen ninety nine. That wasn't it. You've done your research there. No, no, I remember it. I was looking <laughs> after my mum. No, I remember. You got to remember. I mean, nineteen ninety nine ain't that long ago. But there was no, no. Well, there was internet, I suppose. Mm. But mm. I'd never seen mm. the internet, and That's then it just popped up. And I had no idea it was coming on. Yeah, yeah. That that was actually um, th there's a very sad sad kind of career thing around that for for young people trying to get into television because at that time, people like Granada commissioned local documentaries, you know. So that went on to Granada, and that was it. it didn't go anywhere else. Yeah. And then I don't know how long ago, ten or so years ago, maybe more, they just stopped commissioning local documentaries from independent people. Which means that, that that was almost like a little stepping stone for you. You know, you, you got yeah. a little budget, you did a programme for Granada, and that's how you learn to make TV programmes, really. And then you could go on from there. Now, that doesn't exist. So there's like there's a level of production that's been taken out for independent people. And at the time, there was an organisation in Liverpool called MIDA, the Moving Image Development Agency, and they co-funded a series of films made by people from Merseyside. Right. So... Strangely enough, the, the other people who were on that was um, one of the other people was Carl Hunter. Uh, Carl Hunter of the farm fame, you know, he's a yeah. bass player in the farm, yeah. but has just directed his first feature film. Yeah, yeah, he's so he won some short film or what? Oh, no, well, well, he's done a short film, but he's also he's just done a feature oh, film. Oh, right, right. He's done like a 90 minute drama. Wow, cool. 
Um, oh, not aware of that. And that was one of his first steps into making into making television programs. Yeah, I think I think he did. I think they did a film about um, there's a magazine called The End. Right. That who did Pete, Pete Hooten start that? He was a singer in the farm, and that it was a, it was a football right. magazine. It was kind of a lads That's right. yeah, 90s yeah, yeah, football yeah. magazine. Yeah. And they did a film about that, and I think they also did a film about Pete Wiley. Right. Um, there was another film in there by an old hand, a lad called well, I'll say the lad. He was you know he was a he was a um, probably in his fifties at the time. Uh, Rob Rohrer. It right. was it was quite a a well-respected and renowned Liverpool film director. I think he made um, a famous television drama in the 80s called The Man from the Prue, okay. which was a, uh, a murder mystery thing, I think. Right. And his son, Danny Rohrer, became um, a camera operator. And he actually shot this film for us. He was the camera operator. Right. But now he he does he's around the world filming with um, Gordon Ramsay. And, you know, he's a... Very, very well respected uh, uh, director of photography, I suppose. Now, so so th- those little series were the first footsteps for people. Yeah, often. Um, yeah. In fact, there was ju- there's just been um, a, r- a terrific exhibition at the Walker Art Gallery by the Sing Twins. I don't know if you know the Sing Twins. No. It's the uh, uh, sisters from the Wirral, um, and the the exhibition that it was exploring. Uh, many things, but the, well, I think one of the central threads was exploring how cotton affected the world, and you know, people conquered countries and exp- uh, empires oh, yeah. expanded through cotton. And one of the programs in this little series that grounded was about the Sing Twins. Right. I think are they twin sisters? Twins? I'm not sure. So they are still doing some stuff, Granada, then. No, sorry that that was that was a program made in 1999. Oh, right. So you're going all the way but, back. But but again, you know, they were probably making their first footsteps yeah, in the yeah, art world, yeah. and now they've got exhibitions at the Walker yeah. Art Gallery. Yeah. You know. Well, the thing is, though, I mean, what is quite impressive is, I mean, we've not seen each other for quite a while, so there's a lot of gaps here, obviously, for me to fill in. But from that situation, you've obviously established something of your own. You know, you've established your own film company in the intervening. Well, I suppose nearly mm. twenty bloody mm. years now, mm. Mm. and I think that that's quite interesting when you sort of <clears throat> a whole platform's removed, so you've got to then make your own. And I know you're not alone in this. A lot mm. of people have mm. have done similar, and and that's mm. why the media is m- more interesting because it's diversified. And mm. as we were discussing yesterday, it's democratized because three people can make a film mm. and stuff. Mm. But I mean. How do you go about that? How do you go from the situation you were in? I mean, you obviously started off with some reputation that you could build upon. Um, it's, a tr- it's a tricky question because it's what it, you know. Things happen, and you, you at the time they're happening, you don't really notice that they're happening. Yeah. Um, so I I used to make these films for Granada, and we did it. There was a film called Strong Films, a film called Strong Films that. Um, I helped develop with a lad called uh, Lawrence Turnbull, right. uh, Turnbull, and um, Martin. Oh, I forgot Martin's second name. Martin. Anyway, Martin. <laughs> um, and after doing that, uh, West Bank Twin Town, we probably made thirty um, odd films for Granada. Right. In un- really interesting series. There was a series called um, Playing Away, which followed a, um, a football team to America. Amateur football team playing in the you know, the amateur world championships. Right. Uh, there was a film about um, a boxing club from Ellesmere Port that I went that. that went and f- fought a, a, um, a boxing club in the Bronx. Right. Yeah, that's um, familiar. And these were all four part series. Um, oh, actually, also me and Lawrence did a, a did, there used to be a series on BBC Two called Ten by Ten. Right. It was 10, 10 minute shorts from kind of new directors and stuff. We did we did something for that called Night Frontier. So we were picking up bits and pieces. I I, I was often either the producer or the associate producer or, or whatever on these yeah. things. Then we did a, a couple of series called Party Fever and they were fantastic. Each one of those was a night out with a group of people from the Northwest. Yeah. So we ended up making a film about... Um, the Blackpool fantasy showgirl troupe, <laughs> um, and uh, we we actually found um, a pub in Morecambe. It was one of those pubs where the same kind of thirty people drank in the pub all the time. You know, yeah. a bit like the Rovers' return, really. Yeah. That kind of a pub. 
And on this particular night, all the men from the pub got in a minibus and went to the dog racing at Bellevue. So we kind of followed that story. Brilliant. But while they were there, the women in the pub had three male strippers in and a tattooist. <laughs> so there were two kind of parallel stories going on in this in this film. And then the lads come back at the end of the night to... Superb. Um, and, you know, it, it sounds like kind of tabloid TV, but actually, you know, you, you got to the dog racing. That yeah. was an interesting story. Yeah. Um, I, I mean, well before... Um, what what's the the feature film about male strippers? Uh, full Monty. Full, well before the Full Monty, yeah. you know, we're in there with male strippers in the pub. Yeah. Um, and interestingly, after that that film, there was a couple of the women actually phoned me up and said, "Will you please not put some of that footage in I'll the bet film?" They bloody <laughs> did. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, leading up to that, pre that um, Full Monty thing as well, probably about the time you were making that, I remember that um, in Saint Helens there were a bunch of ex miners doing it, who were all, you know, buff lads yeah. and they were the men in black <laughs> and they went round doing male stripping and stuff like that, so I mean, not too far from the truth, that film, Absolutely. really Absolutely, yeah Absolutely. Um, But I mean, it is, it is impressive, I think, the way you've established an independent studio in a time when there isn't really that many people doing it um, Well, it, they're I mean, doing it in the bedrooms as such, but I mean, you've got you know, you, you're established in so far. You, you're creating a, a, a sort of your own niche mm. in a certain way. I, th I think one of the things that you you have to do is not be precious about what you're doing, because you know, in in more recent years, I've been part of um, making ninety minute documentaries for worldwide distribution. You know, this, that, and the other. But at the same time. You know, I'm still doing little corporates. I'm still doing education mm. films, and sometimes there's a lot of stuff you have to do just to keep the lights on in the office. Oh yeah. And yeah. then every so often, you know, a really juicy project comes along that you you feel passionate about and that you really want to do. Yeah. Um. So, I, th I think it is. It, let's not forget that the centre of the film and television industry, no matter what is attempting to be done to widen it out is within the, within the N25. Mm, oh and the yeah, vast yeah. majority of people who are commissioning programmes and who are working in that industry are within that small area. So actually keeping an independent production company going 200 miles away from that is yeah. extremely difficult. Yeah. But at the same time, because of the rise of the internet, more and more ordinary businesses, universities, those sorts of people are wanting films to be made so they yeah. can have a presence on the internet. Yeah. So I've been doing an awful lot of work with Lancaster University. I've been doing work with charities and, and to, to make films which, you know, I'm, I'm proud of making. Yeah. But they ain't 90 minute documentaries. No. You know, the, the, the short uh, science films or this, that and the other. And sometimes what, what um, we shouldn't forget is that making those films means you're keeping your hand in. Oh, yeah, you know, yeah, you yeah, stood yeah. there with the camera operator and you're actually still making things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I remember reading a story, I don't know whether this was true or not, but towards the end of his life, um, I've forgotten his name. Um, da -ka -da, da -da. Lawrence Olivier. Grey haired, <laughs> grey haired, lovely British da film director, did The Devils and. Ken Russell. Uh, Ken Russell. Yeah. Ken Russell, towards the end of his life, um, he couldn't get people to invest in his films. That's right, yeah. So, you know, he bought a video camera and just started making films himself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I remember seeing, because uh, <coughs> Oliver Reed was the, his mate, wasn't he? And he made one with him on that was like a, vi a video production. But, I mean, Ken Loach did a car advert once, didn't he? I think in a few more adverts, you know. So mm -hmm. people can be as prissy as they want about mm -hmm. things. But mm -hmm. at the same time, I agree. I think that you do. I mean, a great uh, example of that is uh, Johnny Cassavetes, if you say that right. I don't know if you say that name right. Or Cassavetes, I don't know. Um, Tez would know. Yeah, from Tez, oh, Tez would be if, there. If Tez were Tez now, be there. he'd tell me. But, um, I mean, he'd, he was the Hollywood leading man. He'd just get the money, wouldn't he? And then he'd go and make his movies, yeah, yeah. which yeah. are sort of like, you know, quite painful if you've sat through a mm. Cassavetti's mm. four-hour mm. special. Mm. But a lot of the techniques he used, Tarantino mm. and others have honed. Mm. And so there's mm. a, pro a progression of mm. ideas totally. And I, th I think you've got to, e even when you're making things that are your passion projects and the things that you really want to make, you've always... I think, in a sense, got to have an eye on the fact that does anybody actually want to watch this? Mm. 
you know, so you you can you can't be too self indulgent about these things. Yeah. You've 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 got to be able to produce things that you think in actual fact you know someone is going to want to turn up and watch this. Yeah. So I'm I'm not going to do a, an Andy Warhol film a building for seven hours and hope someone likes yeah. it. You made us sit through some of that. Though. <laughs> <laughs> I think it would have been Bob Rathmill who did that. Uh, it probably was Bob actually. Yeah. <laughs> well, he snoozed in the car no, on Monday morning. Um, but I mean, I think I'm presuming that the current movie that you've got on release is a passion project, the Lennon movie. It is. Um, I know it's lucrative as well, and people want to see it. Mm, but mm, I mean, having mm, viewed it yesterday, mm, it um, it certainly. I think that you've you've put a lot of yourself into that, haven't you? You've mm. put a lot of the emotional side of it comes burning through on that film, mm, really, because mm. obviously, with I think your choice of using help as well is quite deliberate, isn't it, in the film? Because mm, mm, you know, mm, all mm. the way through the guy's life, he needed fucking help mm. <laughs> in one way or another. Yeah, yeah. So I, I mean, it, the narrative was very strong. I, th- I think. I think one of the things about that is, um, you know, it's called looking for Lennon, and most people's perception of John Lennon, most people's understanding of him, is post nineteen sixty three. You know, he's, he he becomes a world icon. He becomes one of the most famous people on the planet, yeah. and he stands for all sorts of, um, you know, love, peace. He writes some of the best songs I think the planet has ever heard. I agree. Um, he's part of, for me, the best writing team that's ever existed in popular music. And so, when somebody attains that status and that profile, you cease to see them as human beings. Yeah. You see them as these kind of figureheads. And people believe that they know that person, but, but they don't. You yeah. know, they don't know that person. So, one of the aims of making for, looking for Lennon was to concentrate on Lennon's life before he became famous. Now, that was a period of his life when he did have mates. He was an ordinary person. You know, he went to school. He got into scraps. He he, he had family difficulties. He was a boy growing up in post-war Liverpool. Yeah. And the whole of the film is simply about, you know, everything that happened before the Beatles became the Beatles. And so I suppose in that film, what you're trying to do is make a make a small personal film about a world icon. Yeah. And and I think you're you're right that in in a way, um, by honing in on those years, you're able to begin to understand what turned him into what he became. Rather than just what he became, yeah. Because um, we did at the beginning of that film, I don't know if you remember, but there's, there's a, two or three just sound bites from people that we stopped in, in Matthew Street and yeah. said, "What does John Lennon mean to you?" And they'd be saying things like, "You know, he was he he stood for peace. He was a hero. He was this. He was that." But what the question the act the film tries to ask is, "Who was the real John Lennon?" Yeah. And I think you can only understand that by looking at his life before he becomes famous. Yeah. Because once you become a Beatle. And once you become that multi-million selling icon, that I imagine, I, I don't know, but I imagine that does something to you. That changes you oh, s- so profoundly that you almost become dislocated from the person you was before. Yeah. Well, it's almost like the, is it the man who would be king? Mm. That's the transformation that the Beatles went on. Absolutely. It? You know, Absolutely. I mean, uh, they were they were elevated to the status of gods, and I think that yeah, yeah. Lennon was aware of that. Yeah. Hence his comment that yeah, led yeah. to uh, yeah, yeah. the bu- uh, the the records being burned yeah. and whatnot. Yeah. One of the things that interested me most about it, uh, maybe this is because, you know, I never met my dad or whatever. You know, so so it speaks to people with different backgrounds in different ways. All these stories do. Freddie came out of it a hell of a lot better than certainly my understanding is because Freddie's always uh, depicted as a drunken sailor who just fucks off and leaves Julia to bring him up y- y- yes you're right and, and and I think that's because a lot of people um, forget the context of that time in Britain you know, mm. so John Lennon's yeah. born in 1940 his dad's in the merchant navy um, there's a popular belief that you know uh, his dad Buggered, I say, buggered off and left him, yeah. and, and left her to bring bring him up. Well, he was in the merchant navy, and there was a war on. Yeah. You know, he was in. It can be argued he was doing his duty for the country, oh, like yeah. like many other thousands of men were. Now, I don't think he was necessarily the um, a paragon of of duty. No, no, um, no. 
But one of the reasons he wasn't at home with John is because he was away at sea, you know, bringing goods to Britain, bringing yeah. bringing munitions to Britain, which is how we eventually won the war. Well, yeah, and the story about him wanting to take him to New Zealand as well is, mm. you know, I hope I'm not giving too much. <laughs> Am I giving too much <laughs> not away? Not at all. No, not at all. But that not was a all. surprise to me as well because th- that indicates a lot of compassion and a lot of desire on Freddie's mm. part to mm. be a part of his son's life mm. and. Also, his wife, you know, it happened, you know, having been pregnant with another guy while he's away fighting in the war. So, I mean, in just the same way, I mean, Lennon got his complexity from somewhere. I mean, his mother obviously gave him a lot in terms of intellect and in terms of uh, love of the arts and, and stuff. But I'm sure his dad was quite a sensitive bloke. And that story alone, where he texts him to Blackpool... Mm. Mm. Was mm. was quite illuminating. I mm. I really saw him in a completely mm. different light. It's it's an odd story that because you, you're right. You know, Freddie takes him to to Blackpool on holiday essentially, and then has this idea of maybe taking him away, and so that that suggests a desire for a link with his son. Then Julia turns up from Liverpool because she's worried that he's disappeared and doesn't know where he is. So they're both kind of showing love for the son. But then there's this thing where they kind of turn to to John Lennon and say to him, you know, who do you want to go Jesus, with? It's... And he's a five-year-old lad. Yeah, yeah. To me, that's unforgivable. Yeah, and they're <laughs> more immature than the child Yeah. in order to use him in such a way. Yeah, yeah. But, I mean, it, yeah. yeah, there was just a completely... That was a whole new, mm. you know, thing for me. I had no idea about that. But, I mean, th- there are certain things within those stories which can be described as, you know... There's, there's, it's on record that these things happened, but what what people should never um, forget, and this goes for the John Lennon documentary as much as it goes for every single documentary you will ever watch, that this is one particular view of what happened. Yeah, of course. We're not necessarily saying this is the truth. We're saying this from the information we've gathered and the people that we've spoken to. Yeah. We think this is how it played out. Yeah. Yeah. Now. To actually get the nuances of what happened at the time, you know, God only knows, really. Yeah. Um, and it's interesting because um, making that Lennon film and then also making about five years ago another film which was about the history of Liverpool music, sometimes to get some people to agree on what happened 30, 40, 50 years ago is impossible. Yeah. What chance do we have of knowing the truth of something that happened 300 years ago or 500 yeah. years ago? Yeah. And it begins to shake your, your belief in history a little bit sometimes. Yeah. And one of the nice things about making a film like Looking for Lennon is you have, you're you getting a little peek into the personal lives of people and what, and what made them tick. And you're not just looking at the, um, the, 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 the greater picture that most people see of that person. Yeah. Um, so it was it was an absolute pleasure to make that film, and you know, unlike some of the people who would teach film studies, I don't believe in the auteur theory. I think a film is a collaborative process between many many people, and you know there's there's a producer involved there who kind of you know pulls in the money and gets it going, and and there's a researcher there who is like a to be honest, he's David Bedford is like a walking Wikipedia of the Beatles. Yeah. Um, fantastic graphic designer who I don't know if you noticed but we were given access to some black and white photos of John's early life by, by his family and uh, we got a, we had a graphic designer called Paul Skellett who did that kind of 3D thing with them so you actually feel as though these, yeah, these images yeah. are moving yeah, bringing yeah. those to life yeah. um, we had a great camera crew we had a fantastic guy uh, helping with post production and also helping enormously with the soundtrack because the soundtrack is, I think, is fantastic yeah, in that film. Yeah. It's and a it's, good movie, and it's the music that Lennon would have listened to in yeah. the forties and fifties. It ain't just the Beatles all the way through. No, no, no. I mean, his his love of the goons was well documented, wasn't it? You know, yeah. So you can you can see the flavors as we were talking about yesterday, all the comedy coming through yeah. in what they did. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's the thing about Lennon, apart from the other facets to his character. You know, he was a funny bloke. He was amusing, you know, yeah, yeah. and there's so much humour in what the Beatles did. Mm, mm. Um, and I thought so. The the school friends that you used on it. I mean, the guy who he was super posh, wasn't he? The tallest boy in the year. I can't Michael remember. Hill. Michael Hill. Michael that's Hill. It, yeah. 
he, he come up with some good things. I, I remember, I was surprised at that photo. I mean, I did, I do remember that photograph, but I forgot Jimmy Tarbuck was in it. Jimmy Tarbuck. <laughs> Jimmy Tarbuck's next to him, isn't he? And um, I always thought that that photo had in it, and I'm completely wrong. I think I'm getting mixed up with. Is it Peter Shotton? Or is it Tony Shotton? Pete Shotton. No, Pete, Pete Shotton's not in that photograph. No, no he's not. But no. I think I'm getting mixed up, perhaps, because I was sure that that photograph had Peter Sissons in it. Well. I think it might do. Right, okay. I think it might right, do. Right, because the thing about Peter Sissons, it was totally surprised to me that a few years ago somebody said, oh yeah, he went to school with John Lennon. And I was like, Peter fucking Sissons? Well, all right then. And then you'd listen to him on the news and he'd give it away with Iraq. <laughs> <laughs> there was just that little, you know, in the same way that Tom Baker's managed to strangulate the eh yeah, into yeah. Uh, Yes. Yeah, you yeah. know, Peter yeah. Sissons has got that thing. So... Because it was the grammar school, wasn't it? That's right, yeah. So, so you're yeah, going yeah. to be expecting, a, I suppose, mm. a quite a high tier of achievers mm. in there. Mm. But still, it's quite surprising. Mm. Well, you know, everyone often says that Liverpool as a city punches well above its weight in terms of sending people out into the world of significance. You know, right. it's, it's a small place. Yeah. You know, it's not a big city, Liverpool. And I know in the past it was, has been a big city, you know, a million people. Mm. Um, but I think... The makeup of the city, um, in terms of the nationalities that are fed into its character, and the fact that it's a seaport, um, has created a character amongst the people where there are there are more people who rise to the surface from a city like this mm -hmm. than many other places places in Britain. Yeah, and it's one of the things that attracts me to love it. You know, yeah, I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm not a scouser. You know, I'm 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 a woolly back. I don't mind admitting it. Likewise, um, grew up in Warrington, so. Uh, coming to Liverpool probably about 30, 32 years ago now, I can remember that, that distance was what, 15, 16 miles. It was like a different planet yeah. when I moved to Liverpool. Yeah. It was like a different planet. Yeah. It took me six months to realise everyone wasn't insulting me all the time. <laughs> <laughs> that, that was a kind of friendship. Yeah. Um, and what's interesting now is you go back to Warrington and I just don't feel part of it. No. I really do not feel part of it. And, well, and it makes me sad. Because yeah. that's, that's my hometown. It's where I lived for 20 odd years. But I, I don't know. I mean, where I grew up, Haydock, only the place I knew only exists in my head. Mm. It's gone. You know, the, 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 the place that I knew. But I think I'm right in saying, didn't Lennon say that New York and Liverpool were like two halves of the same city? Yeah. Is that correct? Yeah. So yeah. I remember that quote. And it's interesting, isn't it, that the, the rocks at New York Harbour were quarried in Runcorn and, and things like that. You know, there's so many links. Now, I'm not sure this is true, but the one a, a really interesting link is on the Wirral, there's a place called Stoughton Woods. Right. And where Stoughton Woods is, I think it, it's there's a there was a big quarry there that's been filled in. And first of all, I think maybe, I, I could be wrong, I'm, I'm sure I'm, I may be wrong on this, but I think it was filled in by dirt from the digging of one of the Mersey tunnels, right. which is an interesting thing. Yeah. But Stoughton Woods created um, sandstone. It was, it was quarried for sandstone, and apparently it was a special sort of almost like white sandstone, right. which ended up in the Empire State Building. Oh, right. <laughs> I think that I've heard that before as well. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there's a lot of folklore and stuff like that, but definitely he was onto something with two mm. halves of the same mm. city. And I mean... Did, did, did he also say... Um, New York is like Liverpool on steroids. <laughs> it probably did. <laughs> I, I, I think that the influx from the Irish is yeah, yeah, yeah. in in a, a major part yeah. to do with not only, as you say, punching above its own weight in terms of... Um, oh, I can't remember what you said now. It's, something, it's, a, <laughs> it's a good word. Achievements or yeah, something. I can't yeah, yeah. remember what you said. People of significance. People of significance. Because yeah. so I, I think there's a... There's a certain sense of humour, there's a certain intellect, and it's not long ago that that intellect was fractured via sectarianism, which is interesting. Because even where I grew up in Adok, and again, you know, you're only talking the 1980s, our side of the street was Catholic, was Catholic, the other side of the street was Protestant, and we stayed in when it was their walking day, and they stayed in when it was out. Nothing, no conflict mm, as mm, such. Mm, but, you know, there, mm. was, there was still that sort of err of, mm. you know, oh, yeah, d no, you don't want to play with the proddy dogs and all this, that, and the other. I mean, this is complete nonsense, I know. The person you need to speak to for this yeah. is because um, I'm, I'm I'm just starting another documentary about um, the influence of Irish people on Liverpool 
and then on New York, and right. so and that kind of looks at the two two cities and and the similarities often created by the immigrants who were in both cities. Uh, and the, and the, the chap who's working with me is an associate producer called Greg Query, and Greg uh, is is a chap who grew up in um, I think grew up in Belfast in the nineteen Jesus. late fifties, sixties, and seventies. He'd have seen it. He was a youth worker in Belfast in the 70s and I think the early 80s and he came to Liverpool uh, at some point in the 70s and has become um, very knowledgeable and essentially has got a, um, a fantastic take on the Irish story in Liverpool and he's just written a book called um, In Hardship and Hope which essentially is a history of Irish people in Liverpool right. and it's a great read yeah, <clears throat> and it's not. Although it is rigorous in what it says, it's not like an academic book. You know, it's a people's book, if you like. Yeah. Um, and he's a person who also does uh, walks around the old Irish areas of Liverpool and can point out to you where various things happened and right. where there are where there are, are pits of Irish people buried after the. Jesus. Because one one of the things that attracted me to trying to make a film about Irish people coming to Liverpool is. When you read the accounts of how Irish people were treated in the 1840s, arriving to escape the famine that had been going on in Ireland, the way that they were treated, the way that they were, were perceived, the way that they were cheated, and the way that they were fleeced by people, um, and seen as l a lower class of citizen, is very, very similar to the way that immigrants are being treated now, refugees coming from Africa and the Middle East. Mm. And so there are parallels. I mean, I don't want to hit this too hard on the, the head sort of thing, but there are parallels there, definitely. And lessons often have not been learned from the past by people. Yeah. And so, and so that's an... And, and the, 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 the Irish people who fled the famine came to Liverpool. Many of them then went on to New York and were treated in the same way yeah, in New York. Yeah, yeah. It's strange that because I'm... I'm, I'm searching through my head now to remember it I think the book is Carl Redburn I'm not <coughs> sure Herman Melville wrote Herman Melville yeah and he said that in is it Redburn yeah, that Redburn, name? yeah 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 he says in that that the black sailors in Liverpool you know could walk with their arms around white girlfriends and feel freer than they did in the US mm. so it's interesting to know how the Irish were treated mm. Mm. But maybe, you know, if you're in Upper Parliament Street and there was areas like that that were very cosmopolitan anyway, mm. which mm. is, yes. I think, is where Melville's on about, isn't he? He's yeah, specifically probably, probably. on about Parliament Street. As Parliament I Street, and, and I think there, were, there was a lot of um, uh, settling around Pitt Street area yeah. and, you know, but the back of Chinatown and, and those areas. Yeah. I mean, I don't, I don't want to get into too much detail like that because I'm not an expert on that. Nor am I, nor am I. It's, it, but it is interesting how... You know, I mean, every surname of the Beatles is Irish. Is that right? It's, oh, they seem it to me. No potato famine, no Beatles. Yeah, that's bizarre as well, <laughs> isn't it? I mean, and you do wonder just how much of that sort of social comment, uh, conscience, <coughs> is inherited. Because certainly when I was growing mm, up, you mm. know, 1970s, 1980s, my, mind you, my nan, it was a bit of a diff different situation, I suppose, because my nan, who brought me up, was born in 1908. So she was possibly, mm. you know, mm. had all those memories, not as far back mm. as the potato family, mm. but certainly she'd have heard the horror stories from that. And this stuff was still, when I was growing up, growing mm. up in recent mm. memory, mm. so I should imagine that don't trust that person, mm. don't do this. Mm. I mean, mm. in Tom Baker's autobiography, and he grew up on Scotland Road. Um, Which was the epicentre of that Irish community. Yeah, yeah. Scotland Road, Vauxhall Road. Yeah, yeah. Um, and the interesting thing actually about that area, um, if you read some of the studies of, of the people who settled there, uh, a vast majority of the people who, who initially came over, certainly in the 1840s and probably 50s, um, a lot of them, their first language was not English, they spoke yeah. Gaelic. Yeah. So if you'd have walked into that area in 1850, 1860, 1870, you will have felt like you were in a foreign land. Yeah. You know, because the shop names would have been in Irish, people yeah. would have been speaking Gaelic in the streets. Yeah. Um, and I think it took quite a long time for that Irish community to begin to integrate in the rest of the, into the rest of the city. Yeah. Um, and there's a, there's a, there's a guy that um, 
I've got a mate, Ian Prowse, who's a, who's oh, a singer, yes. and he told me about um, a friend of his, um, who's never forgotten, um, who talks about um, what real Irishness is. And he talks about that, that little area around Vauxhall Road, Scotland Road, as being, that's true Liverpool. Right. That's where Liverpool is. Yeah. Um, everything else is out of town sort of thing. Yeah, yeah. Um, Proper scousers, as they call themselves. Exactly, yeah. yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And one of the things that at the beginning of the Lennon film, you know, John Belcham, who's a, a local historian, talks about how John Lennon's character was in many ways emblematic of that genuine coming together of two different identities. Yeah. You know, the Irish identity and the indigenous, as was at the time, I suppose, Lancastrian identity. Yeah, yeah. Um, which then produced something that you would call Scouse. Yeah, even though the, I can't remember the name of the woman you interviewed, she said he didn't have a Scouse accent, didn't she? Oh, um, Hella Anderson, who yeah. was at Art College with him. Well, I, I think... See, this South is, Liverpool, nice. Yeah. I was going to say this is the other thing, because, you know, that, that film opens up with Working Class Hero. Um, and in actual fact, when when John had got past the age of about five or six, and he'd settled in Walton, yeah, you know, he spent he spent his his growing up years in a lovely leafy suburb of Liverpool, yeah, where a broad Liverpool accent was frowned upon. Yeah, I can imagine. <laughs> I can imagine. It still is. <laughs> but he goes on about smashing phone boxes up, doesn't he? And stuff. So you can see he was mm. always rebelling against. Mm. Mm. Any kind of conformity. Mm. There's, there's an interesting um, little analysis that you can do because he got into a lot of trouble at school, and often it was more mischief than being nasty, to be honest. But he did get onto a lot of detentions and 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 a lot of difficulty at school, and some of that coincides uh, with Uncle George dying, and Uncle George yeah. had become his father figure, and I think he died when he was about fourteen years of age, something like that. Yeah, and. It's the sort of thing where now, you know, there'd, there'd be there'd be some sort of social services help to get through those situations, yeah. and and the school would be informed, they'd be making they'd be making allowances for the fact that he just lost a, a, a close father yeah. figure. But at the time, you used to get put in detention. Yeah, I know it's crazy, <laughs> and them saying that when his mother died, he didn't really show anything well th actually there's an interesting thing there because i think we interviewed about three people who were very close to him when his mother died helen anderson who was at, at college with him um june furlong who was the uh, life model yep. who knew him quite well and rod murray who both was at college with him but also shared a flat with him for a little bit and they all seem to have completely different takes right. on what happened to him when his mother yeah when his mother died you know one of them says i didn't ever notice anything Another person said oh, he was crying up and down these corridors. Yeah, and and so often, if you, if if people make a documentary, they're looking for interviews that confirm a theory. Yeah, and I actually thought it was quite important to put views into that film which were conflicting. Yeah, because that kind of emphasises the fact that you know there isn't such a thing as truth, and people have different takes yeah. on things, and and who knows what he was like really. Well, one of your point. images for the movie is the Russian dolls as well, isn't it? That's right. Yeah. Which which I think. Yeah. It's you know it's fitting for all of us, but with uh, somebody with such a, a complex set of personalities mm. <laughs> as mm. that guy mm. had, mm. I mean, mm. it's so tempting in hindsight, and people do say it in the movie that he always seemed destined for greatness, and he was always going to be. I think there's a lot of hindsight well, going on. Uh, there. Of course, of course, a lot of hindsight going but on. But you there. do see photos of him as a young guy, and you're like, fucking hell, he he does stand out. For he really does stand out from the mm. crowd, doesn't mm. he? I think he probably always had a great sense of self-importance. Yeah. Which a lot of people do. Yeah. And I, I, I said to somebody um, that when you watch that film, when we go on about how he had a complex life and this happened to him and that happened to him, we all lead complex lives. Yeah. We all have difficulties. We all have events in our lives that really affect us. The reason that there's a film about John Lennon is he went through all of that and then became a Beatle. Yeah. We didn't. Yeah. And yeah. that's why it's an interesting story. Yeah. yeah. Plus, I think he was quite honest. You know, I think in his work, he was quite honest. Uh, you know, you bring up the line in the movie from uh, It's Getting Better. Mm. I used mm. to be cruel to my woman. I beat her and kept her apart from the things. Mm. That is fucking startlingly mm. honest mm. from a part of his personality that it's. I mean, I think you treat it with great sensitivity in the film and with just the right measure. Mm. You know, I think mm. that that's exactly mm. the way to do it because, again, you're getting into mm. opinions and stuff like and, that. And people do say um, that if you if you look at the the catalogue of Beatles songs, quite often Paul McCartney will write in the third person, 
Lennon writes right. from his own mouth. Right. Yeah. And you know, there's, and there's a different. There is a definitely a difference in the way that they address things. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think that honesty definitely seeps mm. through with him. Mm. Um, but mm. I mean, well, it's a great place that you're going to go next. I think with the uh, the Irish famine thing. I think mm. you know, it's like um, the monument in the mm. town there. Mm. That's you know, and you sort of just stand there and read that, and it's not it's not exactly a big thing, is it, or anything? No. It's just there. No. And you look at that, and and you get the the scale of it from the numbers, and you just like fucking hell. Mm, mm. My mum used to have a, a book years ago. <laughs> You're probably not interested in this. I've still got it if you want to borrow it. Called the Famished Land. Okay. And it's uh, a dramatization book from a lot of eyewitness things. Mm. And uh, my mum used to go on about that and stuff like that. So I think there's in the northwest. I don't know if this was the same where you grew up, but there was it cast a big spectre. For a long time, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know the the yeah, famine yeah. thing. I, I, I was speaking to um, a chap called Mick Ord, who used to run Radio Merseyside. Right, he's got an Irish history to him, and he was saying that he's spoken to people who are alive now, who still feel like the famine casts a shadow over their families. Yeah, you know, and, and what are we now? One hundred and fifty years later, it's crazy, isn't it? Um, and uh, uh, actually, was uh, mentioned Ian Prowse before. It was he. He said something to me which made me rethink about what happened. And he said that um, the Irish famine was of Ethiopian proportions. Yeah. And you know, you for, you forget just the sheer numbers of people who were involved in that. Yeah. And that huge movement of humanity. Yeah. Um, yeah. And. I think um, uh, that, and that's my phone going off there. Oh right, okay. <laughs> answer it if you need to. I'll just turn it off. No, if you need to answer it, Rog, go for it, mate. Let's see who that is. No, I won't answer. I don't know who that is. Very wise. Is somebody, is someone telling me I'm talking bullshit? Oh, all right. <laughs> well, they're wrong. <laughs> uh, what were we talking about then? Ian Prowse was saying to you. Oh, is that Ethiopian proportion thing? Yeah. And and. I think I'm right in saying that the government of the time did very little to help Liverpool cope with that huge influx of people, that yeah. huge movement of people. Yeah. Um, and and Liverpool coped on its own almost in coping with those numbers of people, and not always in a great way, you know. But it, it did cope. And, and one of the interesting legacies, of course, is if you walk down Church Street on any day of the week and speak to 10 people, eight of them will probably have Irish ancestry. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so that, and so someone said, said that um, you, they didn't really see much Irishness in Liverpool. You know, there's not that many Irish bars or Irish theme this and theme that. And um, Greg was saying to me that it's, it's because the Irishness is so enmeshed in the yeah. Scouse identity, he doesn't need that. No, not at all. Because it's just present all the time. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, um, it's funny you're saying about you know them having to cope with the influx with zero help from government and that. It's I do wonder how much of that coping forged the identity as well as the mm. influx. Mm. You know the sort of having to absorb all these people and having. Mm. I mean, you see some of those photographs of old Liverpool. Mm. Obviously, not going back to that period in time. I don't think we had photographs then. But what I love about those old photos is how they named areas themselves. And those names have gone, obviously, because mm. as maps have been drawn and mm. streets have been mm. named. But you see some lovely old names mm. and some old mm. sort of locales and things mm. like that. Mm. And, um, you know, there's the guys that I've been working with over the last few years, and they do a lot of old Liverpool stuff and things. And and these people like that come up in your film, Lord Woodbine and stuff like that, I mean... I was so pleased to see him in there because I'd said to you I'd read an article on him years ago mm. in The Observer, I think mm. it was. And again, it's like, I mean, you could make a movie about him. Oh, God, yeah. Couldn't you? Of course you could, yeah. Of course you, you know, could. You know, quite comfortably. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. I'll have to get uh, yeah. down with that 100 and, what was it, 104, the 100 and Fab 104. Fab 104. That's a Dave, David Bedford book. Yeah, 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 I must get hold of that. I must mm. get hold of that. Mm. Um, so in terms of website and that, what is the website? And it's Bright Moon Media, is it, or Bright Moon Films? Um... I, I run a company called Bright Moon Media, yeah. which, which has got a, a website. Um, the production company that made 
um, looking for London, which I'm also part of, is called Get Back Films. That's right, yeah. And then there's a distribution company who are looking after the the screenings and, and how you get hold of it um, called Evolutionary Films. Right, but it is on iTunes and Amazon. It's on iTunes. Am- yeah, Am- yeah, you can download it, yeah. Amazon. All the usual out- outlets. Yeah. And one thing I must do as well is is because uh, when you were making... Um, Jesus Christ, my memory's fucking... You changed the name of the last film you made. It, it was called The City That Rocked the World yeah. and it became Get Back. That's right, Get Back, yeah. So, I didn't change the name, by the way, but anyway. Obviously. Well, no, names change when you're making movies. <laughs> they even changed the name of Hancock's movies, didn't they? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but no, I mean, so is that available as well? Because I've not seen that. It is. I'm, I, I, to, to be honest, it's that long since that, since we made that, and it's, it's with the distribution company. Right. I'm not sure. You can certainly buy it on DVD. Right. I presume you can buy it as a download, but I'm not sure. Because that I love the scene you had in the Lennon movie of the, I, th- I think it was a Bentley or a Roll or whatever it was, the the twin tone mm, one mm, with the mm. first Beatles manager mm. and uh, the no, not for, it, that was um, uh, two two guys who were in in the back of the the, the uh, Daimler was uh, Sam Leach, right. who was a promoter and often promoted the Beatles. Right. Who actually sadly has died since... Oh, really? Since that, oh, he was great film. value, wasn't he? Yeah, yeah. And, he was top boy. and then the other chap was Johnny Hutchinson, who... Yeah. Um, was the drummer, wasn't was, it? was a drummer and actually sat in t- two or three occasions for the Beatles. And I think they offered him the job, but he turned it down. Yeah, well, he says so in the... But, I mean, a lot of people say that, I'm sure, you know. Um, but no, it was a great watch, and uh, thanks for coming in and having a, a gab. My pleasure. Hopefully, you'll do it again, Roger. Cheers, nice Thank one. You.